you're listening to Construction Cash Flow, examining the human side of construction cash flow and business culture. Need to sort out the design properly, get the funding properly, get it procured properly, get it managed properly financially so you're not paying money, it's not dripping out under the hoarding every night. And then actually how to get it finished, because anyone can start a job, but it takes a proper set of team to finish a job and don't start a job until you're prepared to finish it. Thing is understand the rules of the game and one of the things I talk about when I do public speaking is that what we see quite a lot is people that, that are effectively on a rugby pitch but the problem is they've got a football kit on and they're on a polo pony with a set of golf clubs they don't understand the rules and they don't understand the industry and they don't understand the risks using the knowledge I've got to share that with other people to help them and be the catalyst for them to find it within themselves, their own potential, to then actually go out and actually fulfil that potential. That's my best day's work, not making loads of money. In this episode, it's a real pleasure to introduce you to the one and only, the inimitable Richard Stone. Now Richard has over 30 years experience in the construction industry and running projects. He now teaches coaches and mentors and has a course on compliance and project management. And it's all these things that you need to get right in construction in order to ensure that the cash flow can flow freely. The other thing I like about Richard as well is very tuned in to the human element of when things go wrong in construction and what leads to the high levels of mental health problems that we see amongst uh, people that are in the construction industry. Hey Richard, really nice to see you and I love it that you always find time, you're one of the most busiest people I know and you always find time to come and do a podcast and um, I'm sure the listeners want to know more about your amazing story and I know you've been in the industry for many many years even as a boy so we all want to learn a bit more about that and the experience you've had, where you, how you got to where you are now and where you see yourself going in 2023. Wow. So firstly, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to, to come back onto your podcast because we did do an episode last year, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And, and also, before I get into my introduction, I would just like to say that I think the work you do is remarkable because I've actually had people send me direct messages as a consequence of listening to the podcast that I recorded with you that's given people help from that conversation. So please never underestimate the power of what you do. Thank you so much, Richard. That's really great feedback to have. Thank you. So, as you've just said, I'm Richard Stone. Um, I've been in construction 40 years this year. Um, I was started off um, in footings, digging footings when I was very, very young. Um, I've been on the tools. I went from the tools to a construction management experience uh, with a big national main contractor where I did their management training program for a while. Um, I then left um, and went to work for smaller regional contractors and put myself through my ONC and HNC and then went properly into construction management. Um, Been a really, really good industry for me. Um, I went from site manager to ops director in just under 11 years, managing a team of, at times, of thousands of people. Um, Been through some recessions. That's been really challenging. I ended up literally going from 150 grand a year salary, company car, expense account, to going back on the tools within a week. And talk about hero to zero, that was (laughs) probably one of the the most humbling things I've ever actually done. Not the most humbling, interestingly, but one of the most humbling. Um, And since then, I've rebuilt, built other businesses, coach and mentor other business owners. Um, I'm a non-exec of a number of other businesses, as well as having the construction and developing business and JV partnerships with a number of other developers. Um, and I coach and train other people in project management professionally. 
um, and I train public speaker, and I do a lot of public speaking around the country um, at small and small and large events, um, getting people to understand how to actually deliver their projects safely and compliantly, and still make the profit that they wanted to make. Amazing story, Richard. And do you know what I find with uh, with people like yourself, you, you seem to have. Uh, so much energy to travel around the country doing what you do, spreading the word of, uh, uh, really the the word of being compliant, being uh, detailed about a project and understanding where the pitfalls, the risk could be and, and actually sharing that message. Uh, so much energy. And also, you, you know, the, the, the fact that you you had a good career, you had a good job and then you kind of lost it and had to start again so the resilience um, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about that transition from where you were to to, 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 to hitting on that hard difficult challenge in time and then and then your motivation for for um, getting going again and, and getting to where you are now which is the mentoring role the, the, the running courses uh, giving back and you know and, and sharing that uh, wealth of knowledge that you've got so there's a really powerful word called bounce back ability. And it's something that I've discovered that I've had to find within myself on a number of occasions. And, you know, it's not, I can't remember this, and it's not my words. There's a really famous guy who's got a phrase that it's not about how hard you get it. It's about how much you can get back up off the canvas when you've been it. And, you know, construction is a brutal industry at times. And anybody that is listening that thinks they're in the property industry, doing a few refurbs, you're not in the property industry, you're in the construction industry. And it's tough, it's hard at times, you know, and it's not always hard just because of the physical work, it's hard because of the administration work. I'm looking at a claim at the moment, it's in the millions of pounds where somebody's got a project gone wrong, and literally because some, some, some words on a page are in the wrong place, they're losing probably the best part of 40 million pounds. So it's wow. not always hard just because it's hard being on site in the winter digging trenches, it's hard getting stuff set up and done properly so that the paperwork's in the right place and everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. But I think for me, it's always it's been a very rewarding career. It's been a very, very rewarding industry for me to operate in. It's one that I'm tremendously passionate about. And that's a big part of my motivation for doing the speaking and the training and stuff that I've written. Because one of the things that I've noticed on my journey is that that the actual people that are doing the work, the tradesmen, the subcontractors, the smaller the smaller businesses, are quite often massively disadvantaged because they don't have the kind of the commercial management experience, the project management experience, all of that professional training, and yet they're the companies that are actually delivering the service. So my sort of transition into the sort of the consultancy stuff was around. I got approached by a number of different subcontractors to support them as a non-exec. Um, a number of years ago, which I did, and some of those relationships I still have now. Um, and I found that really, really rewarding. Yes, financially, but also it was the soul food for me. Being able to work with someone in a kind of the coaching role and also potentially the mentoring because they're different, they're different things. But actually sort of have quite a big impact on a business within a relatively short space of time to change their mindset. So... Doing that, I found remarkably rewarding. I've also worked with some businesses where they were a subcontractor and we've effectively transitioned them into a main contractor, which is, if you think it's hard trying to sort of a distressed project, try trying to get a subby to understand about being a main contractor. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's been remarkably challenging. But some of my most challenging bits of work have actually been the most rewarding, not financially, but actually for my soul. And for me, it's as much about that as it is about actually the money. It's why I like mentoring individual people, which is something I've done throughout my whole career. And it's why probably half of my time right now is spent in coaching and mentoring, some of it paid and some of it through consultancy and some through charities that I work with, because that's what I actually enjoy doing is actually using the knowledge I've got to share that with other people to help them and be the catalyst for them to find it within themselves, their own potential to then actually go out and actually fulfill that potential. That's my best day's work, not making loads of money. That's amazing. And I like what you say. You, you're kind of following your soul, following your path and helping, supporting people. I remember uh, years ago, I was a, I, I used to coach uh, football and there was a boys football team under 14s. And 
they were they weren't really coached and they were the bottom of the league i fortunately i was a I, I was a qualified football coach uefa b coach at the time and i brought those skills to them to those lads who had low self-esteem they thought we're no good we're bottom of the league we're always expelled from school and um gave them some coaching because it was the knowledge i had to give to them mm. and they lapped it up and you know they finished top of the league that season wow. by miles and miles and that was one of the most rewarding things and i can relate to what you're saying you know you talk about subcontractors that are disadvantaged um quite often in the in the process of the contractual process and the supply chain and they don't have a representation quite often that you know they don't have the commercial ma managers as you say and the commercial um expertise and and um i could kind of relate to you when you say that was food for the soul and that you you know with your expertise you can go and help them so that they can make a profit that their business can thrive that they can grow yeah, absolutely. So we do quite a bit of work with um, in the subcontract arena. We do work with some, we do support some principal and main contractors, uh, but we're doing more and more work with clients who either want to set up projects that they're going into properly and professionally. So they actually want to get the right professional team around them. Because one of the things that I notice massively is that if you sit in a design team meeting, the language is that it's around a professional team and the team that are delivering the professional services. So many people understand the property industry to be a place to go and create some wealth that have no experience in it. It's not something they've ever done, but they've bought some training or they've gone on a training course and then all of a sudden they want to do some property development. But they've got very little, if any, transitional skills and no experience. And one of the benefits of the qualifications I've got is that, you know, we look at everything from a risk perspective, whether it's commercial risk or operational or safety risk, or whether it's sort of environmental risk or social or political risk. There's so many different types of risks. But one of the big things is, has the person that's actually wanting to, to do this project as a new developer, have they got the skills, knowledge, attitude, training or education to actually to fulfil those roles? And nine times out of ten, they haven't. But they're also kind of fed the dream that, do you know what, it's really easy. You don't need to worry about too much. You know, anybody can be a project manager. Well, Jesus, if I can do it, anyone can do it. There's never a better testimony for that. But I have spent 30 plus years in the industry in construction management, got scores of qualifications, you know, done so much CPD. It's like off the scale. I mean, last year I read 100 books alone. And, and, I, and I tell myself every day when I wake up that I'm, like every day is a school day and I need to learn stuff. So if I need to do that, what chance does somebody that's just coming into the industry going to have? And, and that's why we see a lot of situations where these investors are getting absolutely hammered by contractors. And it's, it's just fundamental. It's wrong. You know, if, you, if you're a building company and you're pricing work for someone, it shouldn't matter whether they're a complete newbie developer or whether they're somebody and you're contracting for somebody that's got loads of experience is you shouldn't be treating people any differently and yet who they are and the horror stories of people getting absolutely hammered it's just shocking so we're doing quite a lot of work in that arena and have been for a while now and that was what led me to write the training course was about actually taking the sort of the three plus decades of my experience almost four decades this year and actually converting that into a course where we can teach people the fundamentals of project management to give them those basic tools that they need to then actually then go out and do their own projects themselves because since being diagnosed with the illness that i've got i'm conscious i'm really really conscious of time it's one of the reasons we use the 12 week year program and every day every hour of every day counts which is quite interesting when you said about i'm busy but i always make time for you i do because i make time for things i believe in and that i'm passionate about and that's why i do stuff like this because I am passionate about it and I know that the knowledge that I've acquired and the skills that I've acquired through being operational and commercial and safety, pull all of that together, I can write a course and some training content to give people all of that stuff that they need, which is what led me to, to write the course that I've done. That's amazing. And I think the course is uh, a legacy, something that you've got that you can pass on as well. 
you know and it's uh, it's an asset um tell us a bit more about the course uh, then richard and, and and who could apply for the course if if anybody's listening and thinking well this is great i really need something like this uh you know how could they uh, um you know how could they apply for the course are they you know is there any 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 running um soon or yeah so we've got a couple we've got two dates confirmed for this year we've got one at the end of january um, which may well be gone by the time this is published. And then there's another one uh, the last weekend in March. So it's a three day event um, and we cover, it's a complete, sh complete, a complete sequence from finding an opportunity, defining what that opportunity looks like, how to get it through planning, how to get it funded, and then how to get it set up and procured safely so you comply with the construction design and management regulations. You comply with all the house of multiple occupation regs if you're doing it. For, to create HMO. So all of the stuff you need to sort out the design properly, get the funding properly, get it procured properly, get it managed properly financially so you're not paying, money's not dripping out under the hoarding every night. And then actually how to get it finished because anyone can start a job, but it takes a proper set of team to finish a job and don't start a job until you're prepared to finish it. So over the course of three days, we'll go through the whole sequence end to end over 300 slides, about 80 plus template documents that we go through. So all of the right types of contract, all of the ways to accurately track your cash, actually certify payments to people so that you're compliant with statutes like Housing Grants Construction Regeneration Act, which no one's ever heard of because it's a construction piece of legislation generally, but it applies if you're doing property projects. So we cover all of that stuff in three days to give people all of the tools that they need. And then after the three days, when they go, they get all the templates. And then we have a check-in call with them up to three months afterwards. So if they've got any queries relative to their own project, then we can we can revisit that and give them the answers again that they need specific to their si particular situation. Because you know, no two situations are the same in construction. We all know that. I don't know of any other course that I've come across as, that is as comprehensive as that, you know, and in my background as a RIC surveyor, you know, always doing courses, always looking to, to learn more, you know, like yourself, we've been in the game for many, many, many years and we're still looking to learn, you know, and it yeah, gets back really. to, you know, a project manager or developer that uh, maybe uh, doesn't understand the complexities of construction, goes headfirst into it, um, believing he can project manage it, and um, and then finds he gets himself into into problems. So if we're learning, you run the course. But this is, uh, you know, the 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 most comprehensive. Uh, I think you'd find it hard to find as much content and a broader content in one course as that anywhere. Yeah, we did quite a lot of research um, around other, uh, other products that are out there. Um, and we also, when we've written the first draft of the course, um, I actually went out to three big sage mentors um, who are within senior positions within big national and global contractors and got them to proof check what I was saying. And the feedback I got from them was really good. We made it probably, I don't know, 15, 20 amendments, uh, which was really positive. Um, and then I also sought advice from people in educational establishments and universities about the educational context of it and the merit of what we were putting across because I'm not a trained teacher. I can teach this stuff because I know it, I've done it, I'm trained to do it and I've got these qualifications. I'm not a trained teacher. So I wanted to make sure from an educational point of view that it was there as well. And the feedback from them was phenomenal. So, And then we've had um, on the first event, some of the feedback we've had from people in the room has been literally astonishing to be brutally honest i mean one of the people in the room has got decades of experience in the industry and multiple accreditations and he's saying look i've learned so much in these three days that i can't recommend it enough to people so yeah i've i kind of feel like the the year that i've spent writing it pretty much has been a good investment of my time I and mean, don't get me wrong i've done loads of consultancy mm -hmm. stuff as well but it's been a massive labor of love I, one of my mentors asked me the other day how many hours have you put into it and i said well there's over 300 slides. There's over 200 infographics that have all been created for the course. There's all the research. There's all the check-in. I dread to think, I don't actually want to know how many hours it was. <laughs> a little bit of me done, but I don't Maybe a lifetime. Done. Maybe a lifetime goes into it. 40 years yeah. into those 300 that's slides, you know. Yeah, that's that's where people have to remember. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. the thing. So, yeah, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed doing it. And 
you know, I'm, I'm doing it, it's being delivered, we've got amazing feedback from people. So yeah, well, you know, as long as there's people out there that want it and people are getting value, we'll continue to deliver it and keep it up to date with latest changes in legislation and stuff. So who would, uh, who would the course be for? So who's it for? So it's for anybody that is in the property industry. So if people are wanting to get into property but have no experience, it's for them. You know, if you're the chairman of John Langs or Skanska, it's probably not for you. But if you're if you're somebody that's also maybe a tradesman that wants to actually sort of increase the like your marketability in terms of you against your competitors, then it's great for people that are at trades level. And some of the feedback we've had from people at a trades level has been amazing. But it's also for people that are in the property industry that are moving on deals. So deal packages or deal sources that are effectively appraising projects and saying, okay, well, if we buy that, we could make it worth that with this refurb. It teaches all of the stuff that they need as well. So so it's for tradespeople that want to sort of level up their skills and potentially move and upskill into project management. People that want to start getting into property investment and want to understand their sort of roles and responsibility and the regulations around that. And also, as I say, for people that are in deal packaging and deal sourcing, because they're quite often being paid as project managers that so they need to understand the rules and the responsibility of the role that they're actually taking on. As I was listening, I was thinking, you know, as a as a quantity surveyor myself, it would be a good course for somebody like me as well, you know, because we have our own uh, specialisms, our own areas that we cover, but there's always other areas and, and, and lots of other compliance that we need to keep up with, that we need to understand, and also to be able to, uh, to see the industry from the point of view of the others in the industry. So, and I think your, your course sounds to me if it's rounded, you know, so it, it gives you that rounded view, you know, from subcontractors yeah, to developers to, so yeah. it's kind of bringing, getting your hands yeah. around the whole thing. Yeah, understanding yeah, the different amazing. layers of complexity of where different roles in different, in different size businesses. So, yeah, you'd be welcome to join us. Sounds amazing. So what would you, um, in terms of the, uh, if you could give, you know, key, key tips, key three tips for somebody thinking of uh, going into the, coming into the construction industry as either a developer or a contractor, um, what would be your three tips for them to start to think about um, before they actually uh, took the plunge? I think the first thing is understand the rules of the game. And one of the things I talk about when I do public speaking is that what we see quite a lot is people that, that are effectively on a rugby pitch. But the problem is they've got a football kit on and they're on a polo pony with a set of golf clubs. They don't understand the rules and they don't understand the industry and they don't understand the risk. So the first thing I would say is understand your personal appetite for risk and then understand the industry risks around this around the deal or the scheme or what it whatever it is you want to do and work out whether they're actually aligned in the first place because if you've got a very low risk appetite moving into construction and do even if you're only doing refurbishments you're in the construction industry that's a high risk environment so anybody that's moved looking to, to get into it from an investment perspective just have a real sort of think about what is my appetite for risk? And if you do want to go, you know, if that's like, I mean, we work on the reg system. So if that's a red light, then great. You don't need to think about it anymore. If it's a green light, brilliant. But then think about actually how much and think quite long and hard about actually what transferable skills have I really got that I can use to make this a success? And if you have any hesitation of a doubt, you need to employ the right professionals around you, not a power team, you need to get the right professional. So you need to get somebody to do do your drawings properly. You need an architect. You potentially might need a structural engineer. You will absolutely, cast iron guarantee, need a principal designer because it's a legal requirement and it's the one thing that most people don't realise they need. And get a proper contractor, but get your consultants to do a proper tender process. Never, ever, ever shortcut the quality of the design package of information because if you think you're saving a thousand pound, because I'll tell you now, that thousand pound that you might save on some drawings or a spec will cost you five to 10 to a hundred times more in output construction costs through amb ambiguity and uncertainty, because no one can price ambiguity and uncertainty and give you value for money. It's physically impossible. You can't give value for money if you're putting a load of risk in there because something's unquantifiable. 
So don't ever scrimp on getting that bit done and don't scrimp on the time it takes to do it either. I totally agree with all of that, you know, particularly tendering. And as myself, you know, been put many, many tender packages together mm. and I'm always refining it. It's so meticulous, you know, to get one small part wrong can scupper the project, put yourself yeah. on the back foot, create risk for you or other people. So I'm always, uh, you know, there's always a refining and always looking at the detail on each project. Really, really important. My second one would be due diligence. When you're appointing yep. professionals, always double check their qualifications. Never ever just assume mm -hmm. that because someone's on Facebook and they're a structural engineer, check people's qualifications. And, and I'll tell you something, anybody who's actually qualified to do what they do will never have a problem with someone saying, can you just please provide evidence that you are an RICS surveyor? Can you please confirm that you are actually a structural engineer? Anybody that's actually got some minerals and that is actually qualified to do what they do won't have a problem. They'll probably respect you more for, for actually asking a question in the first place. <laughs> PI insurance. Get copies of people's quotes. We're looking at a claim at the moment for someone on a project that was finished last year and the contract dates, the start date, has been 2027. Contract written by an RICS surveyor and they've got the start date wrong. Make sure you get people's insurance. And like you say, insurance is really important. It's something that they have to have in accordance with their professional body anyway. And they, won't, and they will carry professional indemnity insurance, whereas sometimes uh, if somebody's just masquerading as a structural engineer or a QS, they may not have the PI or they may not have a very good PI insurance. You know, so it's, it's getting the, making sure the PI insurance is the right, is a good one. Yeah. Yep. So absolutely fantastic well thanks for that richard and time for a quick fire round about you and motivation Go on, yeah. Go on, okay fire so i'll fire the questions quite quickly and Go you it. can take your time if you want to um so the first one is how do you start your day how do i start i've got a few affirmations that i do um around gratitude you know being grateful for the, for the opportunity for a new day um i look look at myself in the mirror and tell myself that i love myself because i think if you if we not, if we don't feel positive about ourselves how can we approach anything else with a positive mindset um i tell myself that i need to learn stuff that every day is a school day um and then i do some meditation um i try and read for half an hour before i sort of start getting into like looking at phones and emails and stuff too much so yeah that's how i start my day and, and try and drink at least a pint of water when are you most productive? When am I most productive? When I'm up against the deadline. <laughs> um, in, in the morning, generally, I'm generally more productive um, in the morning. I tend to get an awful lot done between kind of like six and 11. What's something new happening in your life right now? So we've got some new joint ventures that we're just starting this year, which is going to be really, really exciting. And, you know, we're only 11 days into some of those relationships and the results that are sort of starting to come through in terms of people's mindset shift and results they're getting on behalf of the joint venture are phenomenal. So, yeah, that's uh, something we're doing more of and growing more non-exec roles as well, because I can give a lot more support into a lot of other businesses and re have a broader reach by doing that. What thing would you love to do that may surprise your fan, family and friends? What I'd love to do that might surprise my family and friends. I'd love to learn to play the saxophone professionally. Hey, hey, good one. I like it. Right. So this time next year, you can come on the podcast and play us a tune. <laughs> <laughs> so name a challenge you overcame that changed your life and how has this changed you okay so i think the biggest thing biggest challenge that i've ever overcome was when my wife had a nervous breakdown <laughs> undoubtedly um it's been seven years it's been a really really long hard road but it's fundamentally changed her it's changed me it's changed my mindset it's changed it's changed how I approach pretty much everything I do. It's given me a much broader, much broader focus, but an even greater sense of awareness about the importance of being present in the moment 
but also having the awareness of people that might not be present. So to give you an example, I won't name the person, but there's a person who's in my in a mastermind group that I'm in that literally no one has seen for a couple of weeks. So I've, I've just sent that person a couple of voice notes and a message just saying that not sure what's going on, hope everything's okay, because I was present enough to go, okay, where's that person? Is everything okay for them? Um, and the the other two, moments, two, two parts of my life which contribute to why I sort of approach stuff like that is I've actually lost two of my best friends to suicide. So I'm acutely aware of all of that, all of that sphere of stuff as a consequence of those things that have happened. And I think it now massively forms who I am and how I approach stuff. So, you know, I've been known, I mean, I used to get called the Muller and people used to say, oh, well, we won't let him take his muzzle off until we get to find the cow stage because I was pretty brutal as a, as a negotiator. And I can still be that way. Um, but I've learned to massively contemplate the impact of my actions before I act. Now, it might not always change what I do, it will change and it has changed how I might frame something and the language that I might use. The outcome might still be the same, but I will be far more conscious of the impact of that action. Thank you for sharing that, Richard. Let's really appreciate that. And I'm sure the listeners will appreciate that. And there were a few learnings that to take away and particularly for me you know particularly around being aware you know as you as you mentioned being aware of that of others that sometimes in our busy lives sometimes we're not always as aware as we should be and yeah it's to too look easy out. to miss these things yeah amazing thank you so much for that really appreciate it and i'm sure everyone listening would appreciate that and when they're going and there's some practical things in there that we can we can all take on board so Thank you. So what inspires and motivates you? What inspires and motivates me? Uh, lots of things. Um, I can become inspired by quotes. I can be inspired by nature. Um, my children inspire me every day um, for different reasons. My wife is a massive inspiration to me because of the challenges that she's had to overcome. Um, I'm massively invested in my own mindset and my own personal development. Um, and that of my wife and my children as well, to a different degree. Um, and for that to that end, I've got a number of coaches and mentors that I work with. Um, and some of those are, re are remarkably inspirational as well. But I can take inspiration from all sorts of people. I took massive inspiration from a lady that I met at a networking event just before Christmas because of the challenges that she'd overcome. And I always try in recent years to kind of embrace being courageously imperfect. You know, none of us are perfect. But... If we show up as who we genuinely actually are, we can have much better open and honest conversations with people, which can only lead to having deeper and richer conversations, which ultimately, you know, I get massive value out of having a really nice, open, honest conversation with someone. The only value is that conversation. I'm not trying to sell something. I'm not being sold to just for the value of having that conversation. And I think a lot of people miss the value of just having that conversation sometimes. That's amazing. And, you know, I, th I think it's harder than it seems to have an honest conversation in terms of uh, communicating the picture of a thing that you've actually got in your mind without adjusting it before it comes out of your mouth. And, and, and being honest, actually having that honest conversation with yourself first and saying, well, mm -hmm. this is actually the picture that I've got and I don't want to dress it up to be socially more socially acceptable you know i'd like to be able to portray how i am feeling how i'm seeing the thing and yeah. do it, you know and 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 being respecting of the of the other person and not making them think too much to try and work out what does he actually mean yeah i, I, I had a really great and i can't i can't remember the guy's name which is a terrible show because i'd love to credit it to him uh, but there was a guy i love clubhouse and i'm in a lot of clubhouse rooms and there was a guy in a clubhouse room and we were talking about communication and he used this absolutely amazing visual analogy that good communication is like Torville and Dean winning their gold medal. Both sides totally understand and respect where the other person is at at all times and understand what the other person is trying to say and trying to do. The reality of most people's communication is that it's like week one 
was dancing on ice. And that's the difference. And when you actually look at it, and when you think about the power of those words, it's so mm. true because most people aren't listening to understand. They're listening to respond. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's a skill that needs to be practiced, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We get taught to yeah. speak and we get taught to write, but we don't get taught to listen at school. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, Richard. So one last question. Go for what it. advice what advice would you give to your young self well okay two things i think one is tread your own path and be prepared to tread your own know who, and get to understand who you are so you can tread your own path because we're all on our own journey but recognize that life is a journey don't get too fixated on the destination. You need to have GPS, so you need to have gratitude, perspective, and service, and you need to take some action because otherwise you can have the best destination in the world, but you're never going to get anywhere. But don't get too caught up on the destination that you don't enjoy the journey because so many people get Imagine. caught up in making short-term sacrifices, and I'm a massive believer in delayed gratification. I learned that lesson the hard way when I wasn't. But also, it is good to reward yourself at certain points on the journey providing it's in scale and context of what you've done and it's affordable because there is no guarantee of a tomorrow. So we only have, you know, the past is, is the past. That's in our mind. The future is in our hands. But what we all we really have in any terms of certainty is today. So we have to make sure that we actually enjoy that as well. Thank you, Richard. Words of wisdom, as always, and fantastic. Amazing having you on. You're an amazing guest, and we look forward to you coming on again. And, um, yeah, wish you all the luck with the, with the course, with the mentoring, and with yourself and everything around you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. You've been listening to Construction Cash Flow. The faster cash flows down the line, the more wealth grows for families and communities.